everybody, and welcome to another episode of Past the Wire TV with me, John Stetton, my, my co-host, Jeff Metz. Uh, another exciting week in the sport of Kings Thoroughbred Horse Racing. We had some big news on the Kentucky Derby Trail. We had the Louisiana Derby won by uh, Hot Rod Charlie. He kind of thrust himself in the mix. I don't know whether... Um, he gave Joel Rosario a decision to make between concert tour and, and him or how that's going to play out. But uh, it was an interesting week, l l led probably, Jeff, by the sudden announced defection of, I guess, the early derby favorite and, you know, one of, one of the strong contenders, life is good. Yeah, the, um, you know, the news coming out, he, he worked over the weekend in Santa Anita, but then the, the news came out within a couple hours pretty much and by the time the races had started that was the news was out and it was on social media that uh, life is good had a, a, a slight injury that was going to take him out of the triple crown races so that's um, haven't heard any deeper dive than that but right now basically them announcing that quickly that uh, they probably wanted to get to it before rumors started. Right. And, and, you know, one thing about Bob Baffert, he has been in the past pretty transparent about stuff like that. When his horses get, get, get hurt on those triple crown trails, he usually shares it pretty quickly. And I guess you're right. He probably wants to stop the rumors and kind of get ahead of, ahead of the curveballs, which tend to get lobbed his way a lot when, when, when these things happen. So, uh, yeah, it was all, all, all over the place. And it was interesting. And I'd, li I'd like to talk, you, you know, your expertise is probably – you, you know, as, as good as anybody's in the business when it comes to this, you know, you're, 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 you're a trainer, you've been around horses a long time. Uh, your wife is a clocker at Santa Anita and we'll talk a little about that. So I, I'd like to talk about workouts, analyzing them, looking at them, what to look for, what not to look for, what's important, what's not important. And what a lot of the clockers that, that people rely on miss and what, what those 48 freezing or 49 handling numbers in the form really mean or really re really don't mean uh so wh why don't we delve into that and let me stop by this let me stop by saying i thought to my eye and i've been watching horses work since i'm a kid okay not not with not with the, a horseman's eye like yourself but as a as just someone who's been around the game and been around horses and i thought life is good's work was excellent and i noticed a couple of talkers comment that no it was very consistent with this race when he was bearing out and they didn't like the way he went and he was holding his head up high and i saw you know i heard a million different comments from from a, a, a lot of different people that the work was n no good and I, I i really disagree i thought his work was excellent and i thought if his head was a little bit high it was because he's a fast horse and i think they were trying to slow him down and he still went in 111 for, for three quarters of a mile and his gallop out looked excellent um, and he wasn't getting out in the work as far as I could see at all. Um, what, what did you think of the work? Am I off base or any of these clockers are right or. No, um, I, I was with you. I watched the XBTV workout on, and they had it on some social media sites. And so the workout that I saw on video, he was right on the rail and he galloped out really well. Now, the thing I will tell you is that morning they put on the inside video monitor. Mike Smith had said he was shying away from the video monitor as he was coming down the lane. And it, the, in the morning, it was kind of green with some riding pick six carryover and stuff like that. But during the races, it's actually like a moving TV. And oftentimes right. you'll see the jockeys look at the screen and see how far the horses are behind them. So Absolutely. not all tracks have that, but, but Santa Anita does. And so that they, they that was pretty nice of the racetrack to turn that on and let life is good work to, to get over that shying away if, if that was the case. Now, I watched the race live, uh, this, the previous derby prep before the Santa Anita Derby. And I thought I didn't like the way he was getting out. But was it he was holding him back when he was under hold? I'm like you. He's a very fast horse and he wants to run. He, so they're always having to throttle down his speed. But um, when he got an easy lead in that last race, everything looked good, except for down the stretch. He was well in front of everybody. He, he was drifting pretty hard. And I, I don't know, like that workout that you and I both saw, there was nothing that would have said, boy, he's getting out. He didn't shy from the board on the inside field and he didn't uh, get out in the turn and the gallop out or even down the lane. So uh, I think it's something, and this happens with three-year-olds, especially, you know, two coming three, um, 
you'll get some. What I'm hearing to be rumored is hind end injuries. Um, I, I can't say, but what happens is they're almost like growing pains. And some of these hind end issues, they're just not 100% developed or they get little problems. Um, like it could have been something from a week or two weeks ago, but it showed up as the horse cooled out after the work. I didn't think it showed up in the work, but obviously it must have from the reports that we heard how it came out within probably a couple hours of the workouts. Yeah, you, you know, and it's interesting that you mentioned the San Felipe because, you, you know, I watched the race and as, as, as a handicapper and a better, I'm one of the first guys to look for that, 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 that nick in the armor that says, stay away from this horse if he's going to be a short price. And, and usually if a horse is getting out or getting in in the stretch, it's something I like to uh, avoid. But I looked at it with, with, with life is good race this way. Um, you know, everybody commented, oh, that's a bad sign, bad sign. And I, I, I normally would agree. But in his case, I gave him a little benefit of the doubt. And I didn't necessarily buy into Mike Smith's comment that he was getting out from, from that board. Although that, that, that could have been the case. And I would be the first to say Mike's got an opinion that's better than mine when it comes to that. But what I thought, I said, you know, he's lightly raced he's kind of been thrown from the maiden to the stakes, which, you know, happens a lot in the game right now. You know, we've discussed condition books and the way these horses progress. I thought, you know, he's lightly raced. He's going around two turns only the second time. He's way in front of these other horses. He's got the stands over there. And maybe he was just a little green or a little, uh, you, you, you know, playful or just not focused enough. I didn't, I, I wasn't as alarmed at it as I normally would be looking to wager, you know, when I, when I see a short price horse do something like that. I, like my red flags didn't go up. My, I thought he was ultra talented and I thought that the San Felipe was going to be the test because um, he just gets on the bit and he runs, you know, he's a kind of, luckily Mike's got those great hands that uh, get a horse to relax. But my, my worry is if you get in a 20 horse field or even 12 or 14 and, and somebody's going to have speed in that big of a field. And so if they go with him and it makes him want to get even stronger on the bit, then it, it might be hard to get the mile and a eighth mile and a quarter as you go down the road. But He's off the trail and now new horses I'm sure will be coming up. Bob's already got a couple pinch hitters right behind him. And yeah. you know, in that race, Medina Spirit, he actually kind of took off life is good and let him go. I right. thought then he had to come after him at the end. And um, you know, it's hard when they're having to, they're on the same team and uh, coming out of the same barn. And uh, you know, if he goes head and head and then they both die, boy, both jocks are gonna get, you know, really in trouble. But um, you know, uh, Velasquez eased off and, and, and let life is good have the lead and then he worked out his trip from there but um you know it's tough when you have uh so many good horses and you can only split them up so much you know uh, yeah bob took two out to oak lawn and he won with concert tour out there and um so but getting back to the workouts you know um nowadays with this xbtv that's letting people kind of watch the replays so when you talk about morning workouts like let's say a five eighth you see a 102 or 103 uh, you know, like you stated, my wife's a clocker at Santa Anita. And as she often says, she's just a messenger. She just times the times the workouts and gives them to the DRF and Equibase. There's no comments, no nothing. You know, uh, at Santa Anita, they don't allow whipping like they used to. But uh, let's say going back a year or two and the whipping rule is not in effect. Some people would be whipping 10 times the last eighth of a mile, really pushing that horse. And the horse goes in 102, 101. But now you got another five eighths where the, the jockey or the exercise rider is sitting really still, really quiet. And the horse goes in 103, finishes out beautifully and gallops out really nice. So that 103 looks great to the visual eye, but that whipping and driving 101 does not look very good. And I think the same thing when, when you see these two-year-old sales and they're working really fast. I mean, when they are, when you see a horse do it really easy, then you know that horse might be able to go on. But again, they're only going one or two furlongs. But when you see those horses whipping and driving as hard as they can or as hard as the, the sale will allow, they're going 9.4. I mean, uh, they look like little rabbits. I don't know that they're going to go very far. But for the handicappers, not all tracks have these, but some tracks have what they call private clockers. And these guys share their tips. Uh, you know, you maybe have a, a website subscription or sometimes they actually have a, uh, a tip sheet at the track, you know, as fans are going to get to start to come back, which is happening in California on April 2nd. Um, 
they have these sheets when I go to the races and it'll say worked 101 look dynamite you know they even grade them a b or c workouts you know right. so uh you'll hear tvg or type of people saying oh i saw the workout reports and we really liked what we heard you know and 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 some serious players and handicappers i think for the first time starters in the maiden races they might be getting some of these uh information because they're first time starters and again that 101 work was it in company did he come from behind how did he do it uh so as a trainer when i'm training and i'm telling the owners boy you know he worked 48 49 but he did it dynamite there's other times when the horse worked 46, but he just ran off and he was kind of rank. And even though the time was fast, it's not what you really want as a trainer. You want a nice, smooth work. You know, I, I, I agree with everything you said uh, across the board, really. Um, here's my issue with the private blockers, okay? Uh, I much prefer at this point in my career, and 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 I think we've we, we've spoken before about how how important video replays are to me. And with, with Xbox TV, you get to see so many uh, so so many of these you, you know workouts. And when you look at a clock report, no matter whose report it is, okay, you're really looking at somebody else's opinion at what they saw at five or six or seven o'clock in the morning, okay. Um, sometimes from the stands and. You know, the life is good work is a perfect example. I heard a couple of different clockers who actually sell private clocking reports say he worked terrible. So if I bought that report and read that, okay, now, okay, he got hurt. So they could say, hey, look, I was right. I'm vindicated. You, you know, he, if he run, he would have, he, he would have, he would have gotten beat. We don't know that. That's just, you know, that sounds great on paper, but we don't know whether that's what would have happened or not because he's not running. But if I would have bought that report and went off what they said, as opposed to what I think I saw, that could be very, you know, costly and mistaken. And I'd rather make a decision based on what I see and what I believe that I know than based on someone else's opinion. That's, that's one issue I have with that. The other issue is that a lot of these guys that do this bet themselves. And a lot of them are very close to people that bet themselves, that bet, you know? Mm -hmm. I don't want to buy something from you that's telling me your opinion on how a horse worked in a race that you're betting to, if that makes any sense. Definitely. Um, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll start with a quick, you know, for the people that you wonder, okay, well, how does these private clockers, how do they do it? Some of them have a couple of different clockers, but some of them work by themselves. They'll have a tape recorder, they'll have a running clock, and then the clock will be running because what happens is when the track opens from the renovation, all of a sudden you have about 50 to 60 to 70 horses working all at once. And they're breaking off at the three eighths pole, the half mile pole, the five eighths, the six furlongs. Some are breaking out of the gate. So you have horses starting and finishing all over the place. And so they got this running clock going and they're talking into the tape recorder and they'll say, Bafford had a chestnut, just worked dynamite, time was blah, blah, blah. And then they have to go back and do the math because the clock is running. You know, he started at three minutes and two seconds, finished at three minutes and 34 seconds. So they got to figure it out, do their math. Then they got to go through. Luckily, at uh, some of the bigger tracks, you see um, Todd Pletcher, Chad Brown, some of these big stables. You know from their saddle pads what stable it is. And then you try and zero in on what color the horse is, any markings that it might have. And then those people that sit there and do that every day, they get to know the horses and they're like, yeah, here's so-and-so working back in six days, seven days, eight days, whatever it may be. So that's the single private clocker that's sitting there doing his job. He's taking notes. He's got the tape recorder. He's got the stopwatch. He's got the binoculars. Now we go to the clockers that work for the racetrack, the, official, the officials and the official clockers. So they're in the same, they're up at, up top, like where the stewards would sit, and they are timing horses, as we said, 50, 60 horses, and you have four or five people that are timing the horses. So oftentimes we've had friends come up and visit uh, my wife, and she'd see them, and they're like, oh my God, how do you guys do that? I mean, it looks like uh, LAX at rush hour. You know, the horses are coming and going, and they're breaking off, and they're pulling up, and some are going on out past the wire to the seven eights, and, you know, the trainers 
as trainers, we're supposed to call in and say, hey, we have so-and-so going half a mile. Or if we're going to go to the seven-eighths pole, we'll say we're going a half a mile from the three-eighths. So you try to give the clockers as much head up, heads up as possible. But when they're going and, you know, they, they are like a, a, a well-oiled machine saying, hey, I got the five, I got the four. Oh, yeah, I got the gate. You know, we got a team, you know, and they are, okay, who's coming to the wire? And they are just going back and forth. And they're writing down, same thing. Bob Baffert left a half mile pole, minute 0.4 on my watch, finished up and blah, blah, blah. And then they have to do the math later on. So oftentimes, and now you got horses breaking in, going different distances, and you have to, uh, as private clocker or the clocker for the racetrack, uh, again, you have to decide which, the clockers that work for the track, they don't have to put any, all they have to do is get the times. So they have to get the official times, but some horses get missed. They Nobody saw it, you know, and it ran through and it just, Everybody was looking at something else, and so they get, get missed. So sometimes you'll see a horse that's working every week, and then it doesn't have a work, and you're like, how come this horse is missing a work? Did something happen? Did he have a, was he sick? Was he sore? How come he didn't work? Maybe it got missed, and you just don't know that as uh, the public, so to speak. But then you go to the private clocker, and um, again, he's probably keying on the bigger barns. Although I, I would say, as a player, it's the smaller barns where you're actually, when you get a little runner diamond in the rough coming out of a small stable, those are the ones that are going to pay. You know, Bob Baffert has a horse that's working good; it's going to pay six dollars, four sixty-two. You know, very small. Right, right. But you you have a small barn and a horse that's working good. Now all of a sudden, you get Flavian Pratt out working the horse, and they're like, hey. Flavian Pratt doesn't work for this barn very much, so he must be something there. They see the workout. They make note of that. And um, those are the kind of things that uh, the private clocker is putting in their reports. And then they sell it on their, uh, like I said, either in person or on a website where people can uh, pay. And then they get the, the reports. Maybe they're just, there's a big pick six carryover and they want to play that day. So they want as much information on the maidens or the non-starters. Or they want to know, hey, how did this horse look in between races? He had a couple of maintenance works. How did those look? And they want to get, there's three or four different people that do it uh, for private clocking. And then, like you said, I'm sure when they get something live, they probably bet on it too. Because, you know, not only do they make their living by giving out some of the information, but I'm sure they supplement with their own knowledge as well. I, 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 absolutely true. Um, that's just human nature. Part, part, part of this game. And, and, and there's, there, there's no question that there is some valuable information in some of those reports. A lot of times, you know, you'll find out a maiden has been working with a steak horse or something like that. Um, or, you know, I like sometimes when, you know, you've got a, a, a two or three year old filly working with an older colt and gelding and she's working on the inside. I think that gives them a little bit of courage and, 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 and grit and, and toughness. So there are little things like that that I like to look for when I'm analyzing workouts. But one of the things that I learned very early on in my racing career is that workouts are far from the exact science that a lot of people think that, that they are, okay? A um, couple of things I will share. When I was about 15 or 16, I was standing at the Gap in Saratoga, okay? And Hall of Fame trainer, very straight laced, hay, oats, and water kind of trainer. Back then, most trainers were. It was, it was very different than it is today. But he was sitting on his pony, okay? And he was watching his horses work. And he had plenty of horses and plenty, plenty, plenty of nice horses, you know? And a horse went by that was one, one, you know, one of his horses. And, you know, you could tell he was really interested. And there was a clocker there, you know? And the clocker yelled out to him and said, hey, is that so-and-so and said the name of the horse? And he went, yeah, it is. Uh, and the guy, you know, ran a little bit down the road, was taking his notes, had to stop watching, was watching. And I didn't know this trainer at all. He didn't know me, but, you know, he just looked at me and smiled and winked and goes, that's not who it is. <laughs> and I believe, you, you know, and I'm like, wow, these people are looking in the form, you know, you know thinking that, that this is one horse and, it, and, 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 and it's not. So I, I kind of knew then, all right, that it wasn't an exact science. And I used to go out every morning in Saratoga and I'd hear these clockers all talking, hey, did you get that horse? Yeah, I think he went in 48. Boom, right down 48. You think he went in 48? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got him in 46. No, nah, I got him in 48. I'm putting 46. Like They were all over the place, okay? Not only were they all over the place on the times, they were all over the place on who the horses were. 
was that so and so? No, that was that Philly. No, that was that. Yeah. It's like, wow, this is a little a little chaotic. This is not <laughs> like uh, you know, uh, you, you know, an exact science. But here's a story I will share with you. That's a clocker story. That's probably one of the best tip stories ever. Okay, you know I love these racetrack tales. I think you enjoy when people like them. I had a friend, Ruben Toro. Okay, still a friend of mine to this day. Was an exercise rider. Okay, could never win, and never ever could give you a tip on a horse that would win. Now you know I don't listen to tips. Okay, I don't want to know who anybody likes. I've got my own opinion. Ruben had to give me a hundred horses in his lifetime. Okay, um, oh I get on this filly. She's great. She's going to. They never won, okay? So it was kind of like a joke, Ruben, please. And, and I didn't bet him anyway, but our other friends used to listen to him because they thought, oh, he's an exercise rider. He knows. I'd be like, he doesn't know. He's alive. Stop <laughs> listening. So anyway, one day he comes over to me and he goes, listen, this horse is going to run a couple of weeks. This horse is going to win, okay? I said, Ruben, would you stop her? He goes, no, no. He goes, and he grabbed me by the shirt. He goes, you listen to me. This, this, this one is going to win. I says, Ruben, you've told me this a hundred times. You, I mean, I guess the law of averages is going to catch up with you someday, but you're never right. They never win, whether they are long shots, whether they get bet, whether they're, you, you just, you must be the worst exercise rider in the world. You've got no opinion. You're terrible. You just don't know. He goes, I'm telling you, this one will win. I'm like, please. I'm like, okay, why? why? The horse is working good. He goes, I don't know. I says, what do you mean you don't know? He goes, I don't get on this horse. I'm like, so you're now telling me a horse that some other clocker, that's that are some other exercise rider who's probably worse than you is telling you that's what you're telling me? We're supposed to be friends? He goes, no, 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 nobody tells me anything. I'm like, well, what are you telling me? He goes, I'm telling you this horse will win. I'm like, Ruben, what, what, what? I don't understand it. How, how can you possibly know that? He goes, you wanna know why I know? I says, yeah, please tell me. He goes, because this filly only works at 3.34 in the morning before anybody else comes to the barn and the trainer's main guy who don't say nothing to nobody, everybody hates him, don't say a word. He's the only guy allowed to get on this filly. Nobody else goes near her. And she never works when anybody's at the barn. She works four in the morning. I never even seen her work. I said, you might be onto something. Long story short, the horse debuts at Belmont Park, five furlongs, maiden special weight race, okay? Remember her name to this day was Madam Justice, okay? Antonio Brael rode her, who was not a big rider for this barn and not really a big name rider. He was kind of like an old school journeyman, been around guy, didn't really ride for this barn. Um, Showed very, very slow works in the, in, 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 in the form. Nothing to catch your attention. Um, came from a shop out, out, outfit, though. It was, it was one of the Kellys back when the Kellys were like racing, you know, royalty. Still are, really. Um, she went wide a wire, went by three or four lengths at seven to one. And I knew she should have been about 10, 12, 15 to one, something like that, maybe even longer based on the other, you know, you know, those homebreds used to be in those races back then for those big farms, you know, um, she didn't figure to take that kind of money in that race. And I knew based on what he told me, but based more on how she was bet. It's the fact that she was seven to one in that field. I'm like, she's live. She's, 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 <laughs> she's, she's going to come out running, you know? And, uh, yeah. She, she, she did, and that's how he knew, because she worked early in the morning before anybody was at the track. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew any. And they, they weren't going to tell anybody. But that's what you, you know, like you said, I mean, the track opens at 430 in the morning. And uh, when horses are working out in the dark, I mean, you can't tell if they're bay or chestnut or whatever. Obviously, if they're white, gray, you can tell that. But, you know, there's not a lot of lights at the track in the morning. It's uh, not all lit up like you would think. But horses are pretty good. They can see in the dark. And um, so, yeah, I mean, you could be working different horses. You could be working horses and uh, they just don't see it. Or, you know, a lot of times they, there's so many little things, you know, you guys going in a different saddle towels, not his regular thing. So, I mean, there's little tricks of the trade and, uh, you know, you don't want to be 
caught doing that because obviously there's penalties for that and you would be in trouble. But I mean, working your horse slow or working your horse fast, I think it gets into trainer patterns. When you see a certain trainer that always works them slow, you know, uh, I've said this in the past that I've always been a, a big fan of Bobby Frankel and he would work his horses 101, 101, 101. And I mean, it just, it weren't fast. They weren't slow. They were just solid and his horses right. would go out and run and win. And so, you know, um, obviously he worked his way up to that. I saw him when he was, I, I was too young when he was making it with claimers and doing that. But I got to see the second half of his career when he had Judmont Farms and a bunch of tremendous owners, Edmund Gann and a few others. So, um, so no, the workouts are a big part of it that, um, you know, We'll go back to Bob Baffert. His horses always tend to break well because, you know, he comes from a quarter horse background. You know, right. he's very keen on the gate and wants him out of the gate. And the other thing is, uh, interesting comment the other day, the track announcer, Frank Miramontes, he happened to be uh, like doing the races of what he liked. And he said, he made this comment. He said, if a Bob Baffert horse doesn't win in the first couple of starts, it's probably not something that's going to stick around in the Bob Baffert barn because his uh, his, uh, you know, Bob's plan is to win early, you know, first or second time out and he places them well and, and they're ready to go. They've had company, they've had gate works and they are, they are honed to win first time out. They have all the tools and skills to be ready to do it. And he's got tremendous pedigrees there too. So, um, but that's, uh, did you have any other questions on clocking timing? Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a couple. Uh, okay. is, is it as much of an advantage that I think it is? for guys like Chad Brown, Todd Pletcher, Bob Baffert, who could send their horses out, not only in sets and in company, but with different calibers of good horses and train them and school them that way and send them you know, into the gate for their first start with that kind of experience, as opposed to a guy who's only got a couple of horses and you know, can't really school his horse and work his horse in that kind of company as often. And you know, some guys have to even ask, somebody else, hey, you work on a horse today, can we work in company or some, something like that? How much of an advantage do those big barns have in training because they can do so much with all of those horses working and schooling them and putting them inside or outside of different caliber horses? Is that, I think that's a significant advantage for these guys, right or wrong? Definitely, it's right. Um, I think, you know, what happens is whenever a trainer has a uh, a lot of, a couple of gay works but he has those works with two or three horses uh, i think that definitely means business you know they uh, they get a little dirt in their face they come from behind they might stumble a little out of the gate and they still have to recover and go about it and when you when the horse is working by themselves oftentimes they're getting in shape but they're not getting all that extra stuff and so definitely when a barn is bigger that that can help you know i worked as assistant trainer for a guy named dan hendricks and uh, he was winning with a lot we were at that time winning with a lot of first time starters we had about a 40 horse barn and we had a lot of uh team drills twos and threes where we were working them together and they were basically like little training rooms. I've been able to, uh, you know, utilize that as well. I had uh, three horses this past summer in Washington. And uh, so I was working them. They were on the same pattern, right? They were going half miles together. Then they went five eights together. Then they had a three horse drill out of the gate. First time out winner. First time out winner. First time out third in the same race with the other horse that won. So, and those were all, uh, you know, uh, made in 25,000, made in special weight, which was the higher levels there at uh, Emerald Downs in Seattle, Washington. Right. So I think, you know, at any level, whether it's a small track, big track, big trainer, small trainer, I think definitely that experience. And another thing that you can put all this work into them, and then the horse draws the one hole in a 12 horse field. Well, that's very claustrophobic for a horse. And if they haven't had a lot of those company workouts, like we've said, you know, that can be very intimidating. Um, and then so much happens at the start in the maiden races because you have a lot of inexperienced horses. And sometimes you see fillies, they, they're slow to load in the gate and the horses are standing in the gate and now they're flat footed when they break. So all that preparation you do in the morning with your workouts and, and company and stuff like that, uh, there's a lot that kind of comes into it come race day. So, but definitely, um, 
I've, it's one of those things that I always strive for, but when I have a horse that works just according to plan and does it even better than you plan, boy, that's when uh, that you walk back to the barn and you feel like you won a race because it all came out, not only good, it came out better than you thought. You know, you planned it like, oh, hey, we're going to get a little company. We're going to sit behind this horse. And when the rider just moves his hands, he's going to go nice and easy and go about it. And, and, they, and I think, <laughs> here's a funny story for you. So, so they shot that movie. Um, it's called Sea Biscuit, and they filmed it at Santa Anita. So at Santa right. Anita, they had all these bay horses because they couldn't use the same horse over and over. That's too much for one horse. So the horse that played Sea Biscuit or his lookalikes, he got to win in the scene, right? So he he'd come and win. He'd come and win. So well, the movie's done, and they ended up selling these horses, and they went different places. Well, I was told that he went to a small fair circuit somewhere and he just started rattling off some wins because he actually learned how to win by being right. able taught to win and go past horses. So right. I think there's a lot of that. You know, what you said is that the confidence that they get from the morning workouts, it can translate to the races. And, uh, you know, I see that a lot with Bob Baffert. He, he'll work a horse behind the, the, the leader and he'll come and get him. And that horse is learning how to sit off the pace and be a good horse. And uh, I see it with certain jockeys that, you know, they're not necessarily speed riders. And when you see them on the lead, you know, they got a lot of horse because they always save something for the finish. Right. So, right. Um, that, and that, it's the same that, with the workouts. That's for sure. Now, let me ask you this, because um, you're not even close to being off the hook with some of these questions here. Um, tell us what a morning glory is and what, in your opinion, makes a horse a morning glory. I mean, they, they fool everybody. They're fooling the clockers. They're fooling the trainers. They're fooling everybody. So what is a morning glory and what makes a horse a morning glory? And what can I look for or any better look for in a workout pattern or some kind of tell that this hot horse that everybody's all over might be a morning glory a la the green monkey, who I guess worked faster than anybody sold for a fortune and couldn't run a step. Yeah, I mean, you sometimes in Southern California, because that's where I see it, but I see it happen at Gulfstream and, and New York, uh, Belmont as well. You see horses that they paid two, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars and they're running in maiden 20 and maiden 30s and they're still not winning. Some of these bigger barns, they actually don't even want to run, you know, they run them and they, but they're just, they're going to be a loss. So what happens is in the morning, these horses are by themselves sometimes or they're with one other horse, like we stated. And what happens is they're just brave and they're feeling good and stuff like that. But the minute they get in the gate with eight, 10, 12 horses, all of a sudden they're, they're intimidated by dirt in their face. They're intimidated by being between another horse and the rail. Um, I go back to that known agenda that we talked about a while ago. So we know he's a good horse, right? He's probably working good and he ran a dynamite race. But when we saw him, he didn't like being down on the rail and this and that. Luckily, he showed himself because some people, when they pay a lot of money for a horse, they, they expect things right away. I mean, one or two races, they want to see what that horse has. They're not going to give a horse five to 10 starts to break its maiden because there's very few horses that have taken 10 starts to break their maiden that become stakes horses and then just be continual winners. So when horses kind of struggle to win, even if they drop them down and put them in a certain place, because what I've noticed in Kentucky, there's a lot of tracks in that, in that area. So somebody that's got, um, you know, Godolphin or Judmon or somebody like that, they might have a royally bred filly that they don't want to put in a claiming race because she's more valuable as a broodmare than she is as a runner. So she's not winning at Keeneland. They might go to uh, Indiana Grand or they might go to Belterra and they're still running maiden special weight, not risking her for the claim, but they want to break that maiden so that they can go on to the breeding shed and she's a winner. She's not unplaced. So if they put that horse in the sale, but those morning glories, I, I think the tell is, the form and how they run. I don't think you can tell um, in the morning. I think you go to the races thinking, man, I got something here. I've seen other people spend eight, 900,000 for them. And I've ended up with those horses in a smaller venue. But the thing is, they were working good. They had the pedigree. But when it came race time, maybe small infirmities got to them and they couldn't overcome them. Or, uh, you know, they just, 
a little term we like to use is they would fold like a cheap suit, you know, and, and in sports terms, it's like, you know, you're hitting the key three pointers and you're hitting those free throws. But when it's the last couple seconds of the game, it's all different. You know, all of a sudden that free throw counts and there's a lot of pressure. The stands are full, the time is down and now you're tired. And so you got to make those shots and you've made a hundred, 200 in a row in the gym. And now you got to go under the pressure situation. And I think that's what gets to these morning glories. You know, they just cannot adapt to the afternoon pressure because, you know, you have so much goes into the race from the time they leave the barn, you know, at Santa Anita, they go into a barn and they get blood drawn before the race to make sure there's no bicarbonates or milkshaking, as they say. Then they get put on a scale. It's a horse scale. It's very minor, but they get put on a scale and they get weighed. Then, you know, prior to that, they got Lasix, if Lasix is, is okay to have. And now you go forward and you go to the paddock. Now you got a saddling paddock. You got to saddle up with, you know, again, we're talking first timers. Some of them have schooled in the paddock, but again, you've got First time starting horses, you got a lot of people around checking on them, watching them. They get a little nervous. Now they get saddled up. That girth is tight. It's a strong elastic girth. Another thing that could bother them. Now the jockey gets on and, uh, you know, it. you see this in the paddock a lot with first time starters. Most of the time when you're at the barn, you leg the jockey up and the horse is standing still. But sometimes in the paddock, the horse is on the walk and you go to leg the jockey up and they see the whip out of the corner of their eye and they're like jumping and spooking. Another little thing. Now, here's another one. They get to go to the pony for the first time. Sometimes it's the first time. I try to take mine quite a few times with the pony so they're used to it. But how many times have you seen the handoff from the groom to the, the lead pony and all of a sudden this horse spooks, he rears up you know, all these different things. So now he goes to the warm up. He's warming up for the race. Now you go to the gate. Some don't want to load or you're in the gate and the other ones don't want to load. So now you're standing in there. Your adrenaline's pumping. You don't know whether to rear up, charge the front of the gate or stand flat footed while you're waiting for everybody else. So all these things have to come into play and you have to overcome. Then the gate opens and my jockey or Somebody's jockey says, you know what, right as the gate man went to kick it, my handler backed my horse up so he would not be in the front of the gate. And now he's off a step slow or the ground breaks out from him because he tries too hard. So there's all these little things that go into it. And we haven't barely got two jumps out of the gate yet. So when I think you, when you say morning glories, you can do all the preparation that you can in the schooling in the morning. But it really comes down to the race and how they perform under pressure. And I think that's what makes the greats, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, Kobe Bryant, Tiger Woods. These guys showed up, you know, you knew they and they weren't they weren't greats to begin with. Some were, some weren't, but but they continue to get great. And um, but like these horses that are working like dynamite, they're beating other horses and stuff like that. I got a quick little story for you that uh, I had a horse this past summer working at Del Mar. Bought him privately in a package that we got. And so the horse breaks out of the gate and he was in the gate with a Bob Baffert horse. So we work and the Baffert camp is saying, man, who's that horse you worked? And I go, oh, you know, it's this little horse here, you know, whatever. And he said, um, wow, because we kind of like that filly and your horse just beat him by like three lengths going easy. Well, we fast forward about three or four months. My horse didn't run too good at Del Mar. He ends up winning as a bottom claimer at Emerald Downs. And the horse that was working out of the gate that hadn't run yet turns out to be a filly named Calypso for the Bob Baffert stable. Goes on to win stakes. So I'm running for 3,000 up at Emerald Downs, and Calypso is winning great races at Santa Anita Park. So that's where morning glory, that's a classic case of morning glory. I mean, this horse was fast, he had speed. So now I, we run the horse a couple times. He's afraid of dirt. He doesn't like it, this and that. You know, you have to tell the owners, you know, I, I hate excuses, right? I hate them. I'd rather say, you know, we got beat. That's that. But he say, man, the horse didn't like the dirt. He wouldn't run at all. So now, uh, same thing, two times. We tried him, tried to rush him out of there so he wouldn't be in the dirt. But you can only go as fast as they'll go. So it didn't work out. So we end up stretching him out to a mile where he could get the lead easier, didn't get any dirt, and away he went. But 10,000 at Del Mar and 3,000 at Emerald Downs are a lot different stories. So, but that's his story. So you're me, I mean, let me just get this straight because this is a classic. We've got a $3,000 claimer. Mm -hmm. 
that that outworked Calypso, a graded stakes winner from the Baffert Farm. That's correct. That's and beautiful. and and That's and beautiful. on the backside because that sums because the, up work. The, the, the starting gate is at the quarter pole. So when they work, if you're going five eighths out of the gate, you end up on the backside, which is about the five furlong pole. So there's these stands where everybody watches. You know, the big trainers are all there. There's one at the half, and there's one at the five eighths. So Bob Baffert stands at the five, and they're watching their horses, and. I told you my son works for Bob Baffert. So he, you know, the, the guys are giving me a hard time. Hey, Jeff, who'd you work with us, man? Because trust me, I never want my horses to get in the gate with Bob Baffert. But unfortunately, it was right. so busy back there behind the gate. There's 20 horses waiting to load. We got in there and off we went. So I was like, <laughs> we'll take the company. They're like, oh, no, no, this one hasn't run yet. Okay. And it's a filly right. and this and that. But uh, Lucky, and we outworked it, which I didn't think we would. The horse works 59 and change out of the gate, and I don't really work horses that fast. And then it, later on, they're like, oh, that one's just okay. And then I see it winning stakes at Santa Anita. I'm like, I think it's better than okay. <laughs> it is, she is. Now, yeah, yeah. workouts on older claiming horses that have a lot of stars, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old horses, they've been running forever. They've got a ton of starts, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, war horses, I like to call them, you know, uh, how less important or less significant are the works of those type horses who are kind of pretty much established and you kind of, you know, know what you're going to get, how, how important are their works in comparison to a two year old that's run once or twice and is now going along on the grass for the first time after two sprints or, you know, an inexperienced horse, huh? Con contrast that for us a little bit like how how uh, see i think those works are not all that important on those war horses and you know i'm going to rely more on a racing form and the replays to to see how they're doing and and and, and what kind of you know where they are in their form cycles uh as opposed to the inexperienced l lightly raced younger horses that have only a couple of starts i'll put more credence into those workouts and and how they're training right, wrong, and different. No, I think, um, you know, so these war horses are, you know, older horses that have been running. I'm, I totally agree with you, you know, as, um, let's say a horse player or a trainer, either way. So if you're looking at a horse and the horse is run second, third, second, he's pretty consistent. Now, if the horse is run ninth, 10th, 11th, and he's working 46 bullet work, bullet work, I don't think those bullet works do you any good because, even as a better, you're saying, what this horse is working good. Yeah, well, he worked good the other two in between the other two starts, and he's still running last. So um, I think what happens at smaller tracks is you don't even see a lot of workouts. And what I used to find back east was horses would go like in Florida, Tampa Bay, or something like that. They'd be a couple half miles and they'd go run five and a half, six furlongs. But in California, what I noticed, especially in Southern California, is a horse will have five or six, six furlong workouts before it races. So they are extra tight, extra fit when they get ready to run their first race. And they actually have written in the rules that they want a horse that has not run within 30 days. They want them to have at least one official workout within the last 30 days. Right. So by regulations, you need to work them. Now in Europe, they don't even have time workouts. So you're just going off who's good with the, those type of horses, whatever trainer's good with young horses, trainer's good with older horses, you know, that kind of thing. But I don't think, you know, when a horse is run a lot, I think he could have an easy breeze. He could have a strong gallop, good, you know, open two minute lick for quarter mile, half a mile, whatever you want to do. But I mean, I've seen some horses just jog in between races and win stakes. So I don't think that uh, the workouts are quite as important in the older horses. Um, although, you know, I've seen guys that every seven days they're on the work tab and when they're running, you know, I mean, that's kind of an old school thing, but they'll win a graded stakes uh, in New York. And when they come back to California, seven days later, even after getting off the plane, they're on the work tab. So, I mean, that, that works for those people. And um, so people go with what works for them. But I personally think um, I would rather save them. You know, I'd rather save the legs. I'd rather save the concussion. I, don't, I think a little maintenance, a little opening, you know, as they say, speed kills. So the less we have to use it, the better. And, um, you know, I would rather use that 
you know, because I think a horse has a strong two to three furlong run in them. And if you hustle them out of the gate, you don't have the two or three furlong run like you need at the end of the race. If they can break, get position and kind of coast along is deep breathing. And then when they go that last quarter mile, that's when it really counts. And uh, so I think the works keep them in shape. They keep them fit. And when maybe a horse is coming off a layoff, they need those works. But those hard campaigners, I think they could have a very easy, modest work. And I think that's plenty for them. And I don't think they need it every week. Now with the triple crown coming, we got the Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont run in very close proximity to, 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 to each other. I've always felt a little stronger about a horse that's run in the Derby, Preakness, and is now running in the Belmont. Regardless of whether they've won the other two or not, they don't have to be going to the road with this. Horse that's running in all three races, and now he's running in the Belmont. Okay, if he works between the Preakness and the Belmont, um, which you've got that three week space there, so mm -hmm. I, I tend to like that. Okay, when I see a horse not work between the Preakness and the Belmont, that kind of sends up a little bit of a red flag to me that eh, maybe he's a little tired, maybe the trainer is worried he's a little tired, maybe he thinks he's just going to gallop him into the race and he's fit enough. I get all of that fit enough stuff. I understand what that means. And I'm not saying that it's wrong. I still want to see a horse that I'm backing with my money coming out of that Preakness work before the Belmont. Even if it's a slow maintenance kind of work, I want to see him work. I don't want to just see him jog or gallop into the race. What are your thoughts on that angle? I, I agree. I think, you know, some of the things you have is those five races – or three races in five week span is you have shipping and travel in between each track and you have different surfaces, you know, deeper sandy tracks and, and just different from one to the other. But I'm like you with that three week period, you know, the, from the Derby to the Preakness, you can maybe have a little half mile, easy maintenance going into it three or four days out, five days out. If you wanted to get them a little something over uh, Pimlico's track. But when you get to Belmont, you probably want to have a nice work, four or five you know five or six furlongs get a nice workout over the track i mean most most of the guys will go five eights just kind of in between not too far not too short and uh and then they get a, a work over the track it puts them on a steady regular pattern and that um you know that that seems to work so i'm like you with that three week span i would like to see a workout back in the day i, I you know and I, I, don't, I don't have any stats on this i just go by my own observations you used to see back in, in 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 what i call the glory days of racing and like i said earlier the hay oats and water days and and, and when you used to see a lot more of the three furlong blowout the day before the race mm -hmm. i even saw some guys do it the day morning of the race okay <laughs> blow horses why do we see that so much less today and what is the meaning or significance? What, what was it, is it good, bad? What, what, I, I used to like the three furlong blowout day before the race. What is what what, what is that signify? I, I used to see um, you know, Richard Mandela, Charlie Whittingham, I used to see them, you know, by by that school of thought that you're talking about, a three eights, a couple of days before the race. You know, that was their plan. And now uh, what I've noticed more on the East Coast than on the West Coast is you'll see guys not full on work, but in the post parade, they'll take them away from the pony and they'll let them have a good little gallop. You know, it's almost like, you know, those European horses, they don't have pony horses, but when they leave the paddock, they turn and kind of go really fast for uh, a quarter mile or three eighths. You know, it's not workout speed, but it's close to it. And some people um, are of the opinion that it really uh, gets the red blood cells, you know, where they want them to be whether that be a couple days before the race or you know blow out any lactic acid or in that pre-race warm-up to really get the blood flowing and to get those red blood cells uh, engaged and ready to go so some horses are good and can handle that they can get that warm-up compose themselves and come back to it but there's others that are a little strong and uh, jockey might not be able to hold them and they do too much pre-race. So then they'll be like, oh, I couldn't stop them and the outrider had to catch him or something like that. So there's that fine line of, you know, when they're on a fever's pitch edge, ready to run, sometimes they're a little too strong and a little too hard to hold. And that's why we do use pony horses here in, you know, in the US. And um, that's uh, 
But that's what I think is why they want to do those little bursts of speed because it kind of opens up the lungs and it gets the uh, red blood cells where they want them. Now, I, I think we could we we could kind of ra- wrap this up on this next uh, next question, which I think may, may be a little of a, of an involved answer. Okay, we we know how competitive horse racing is. Okay, now in my opinion, you know the big barns, you know the, the Chad Brown, the Pletcher, the you know Baffett, Mandela, these guys, uh, you know they pretty much have a, a stakes oriented program. They're not really looking to hide anything in their works. Most of their works are publicized on, on, on Xbox TV. People are watching them. People know who those stakes horses are. They're following them, even the, the well-regarded guarded maidens. And most of the time, the money shows on the good ones from, from, from the not, such, not, not, not so good ones. And, you know, even if it's not the win money, it's sometimes the exact the money or the pick three or pick four. The, the money tells on, on, on those real runners from those good barns, okay? Now, the claiming side of the game and the lesser known barns are a little different, okay? So if you're analyzing or, 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 or getting deep into workouts in claiming barns, okay? Isn't that dangerous from any perspective, not only a betting perspective, even if you're looking to claim, if you're a claiming trainer and you want to claim a horse, I think that workouts are probably the last thing you're going to want to look at because you're going to want to look at the form, look at the, you know, what you can eyeball on the horse and in the, in the pattern. Don't those guys, and I'm not, not saying cheat, but don't those guys have a reason to be less forthcoming and transparent in how their horses are working and training I mean, it's just, isn't that just inherent to the game to be less transparent how my horse is working or training? If I'm running a horse that I paid 35 or $40,000 for that I think can win for a nick for, for 25, but I don't want to lose him. So I know he's training good and I got him right. And I, you know, but I don't want the whole world to know he's training good and training right. I don't want every clocker who's in the stands to know that because People who buy those reports tell other trainers, they tell this one, they tell that one, and boom, now I run my horse for a quarter that I could have kept in the barn and got that win, and now, you know, running back in a starter or wherever I want, and all of a sudden, he's in somebody else's barn, and if I happen to run it into somebody else who's got a little bit of faster horse that day, now I lost him, and I didn't even win. So, isn't the game set up for a little bit of lack of transparency. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong. I'm saying it's part of the game. Lack of transparency. I mean, what can a clocker tell you about those kind of horses really, or anybody? I mean, it's kind of like every man for himself out there. Am I wrong or right? Or talk about that a little bit. It's, um, I think that, you know, guys that are, you know, in the claiming game, obviously they don't want to lose them. Um, when, when you go to a Midwest track like Oakland Park, Keeneland, Churchill, I mean, these claims are pretty obvious. I don't think you're going to hide much. You know, I think the, the horse is anywhere under five to one. I mean, I think they're getting claimed in that race. You know, there's multiple eight, 10, 12 way shakes on these big because the purses are so good in that area. But getting to the point that you're talking about is if you have a mid range claimer and he's working good in the morning, um, you know, maybe his times are slow, but, you know, he did it well. Or, um, you know, I don't do this, but I know it can be done or I could do this is, you know, you work a horse five eighths, but he really slow when he starts off that first eight and then he finishes really good. So now you got a 103 workout on the tab, but it really was a 35 interior. So it's kind of a hidden, I'd say a hidden work. Uh, It's not, it's public and it's there. I mean, is that something that even a sharp clocker who's out there, the sharpest clocker in the world, whoever that may be, all right, is out there and he's watching all these horses work, okay? And he's got all of this going on and making notes all over the place with pads and this and that and stopwatches and the Apple watches and whatever these guys are doing out there and videos, I know who knows, right? Is that something that even a sharp guy can pick up if he's got that internal split like that, the 103? I think in the daylight, yes, they will catch it. I think in the dark, they won't catch it because in the dark, it's hard to see and it's hard to gauge that. But in the daylight, when you 
I think you're going to see if you do that scenario I said where you start off really slow in 14, 15, first eighth and come home in 11s and 12s for, for an eighth of a mile. So you, you're going to notice that. Because what's going to happen is the horse broke off slow, finished full of run. And that's going to be the comment nine times out of 10. Or, you know, you work the horse, you get to the wire, and now you're saying, okay, he galloped out. You just really let him go. And when he gallops out, now that's going to catch the eye. Hit the wire, full of run, continued on, and that's going to catch the eye. So in the daylight, no matter how much you disguise it, I think the sharp guy is going to find it. But in the dark, it's two things happen. One is those guys don't like to come that early. I won't say all, but some, I think. And two is it's hard to gauge those moves in the dark because what happens is when you're watching the horses work, you know, if you have your binoculars, you can see it, but it's still just not the same. And again, XBTV is not filming in the dark. They're not filming workouts in pitch black and your rider's got a little blinking light on him on the helmet so you can see where they're at. But what happens is you just... What people that watch workouts all the time, they can see those subtleties and they can see that interior move and say, start it off easy and finish strong. And anytime they're strong to the wire, because what you see a lot of times is when they dig that's, up. The that's good information. That, yeah. that, that, that's the kind of stuff that, that, that it helps to know. Yeah. If you could find that out and it's hard to say, although I know who the guys are that work them in the dark. I know who the trainers are that do that. Um, I, I'm not in that position. I don't, I'm not there. I don't need to do that. I mean, I could do it, but I don't need to. Um, and uh, goes back to I, goes back to my friend Ruben Toro. He yeah. knew that Philly was gonna win because yeah. he never yeah. got on her, but she That's worked out it. before anybody was at the racetrack. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. I'd give you more information, but I'd have to charge you for it. So uh, anyways, <laughs> but uh, no, uh, all joking aside that um, you know there, there's different ways to play it, and I don't think you know, um, like when I heard another counterpart trainer saying, you know, a horse had a, a throat surgery. Now he's working good. You don't know why that is. And it doesn't say in the racing form, uh, throat surgery, you know, it doesn't say, right. uh, you know, you see blinkers on blinkers off, but it doesn't say throat surgery, had a chip taken out of the knee or the ankle, you know, now he's working lights out. Uh, you might see the times improve, but People don't go that far back, you know, when there's a break in the action, like 30, 30 or 60 days, the, the workouts go pretty far. But if a horse has had like a six month layoff, those workouts kind of drop off the page unless right. you're really doing a, a full on thing. And I think most people are keying on the last 30 days worth of workouts because those are really the ones that are important. Yeah, no, it's, it's it, 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 really interesting stuff. And thanks for being um you know, so, so transparent and so forthcoming about a lot of this stuff, because it's, it's, it's really fascinating. And I think it's a big, a big help to, to players to understand, um, you know, what happens with workouts, what, you know, what's really going on in the morning, how chaotic sometimes it is, but how sometimes, you know, like you said, the shop guys can pick up stuff that is, you know, valuable to know if they're truly willing to share it. Yeah. Uh, which I'm sure some of them are, you know, some of, some of, some of them are good and some of the, some of them. And, sure. I, and I'm, you know, I'm of the opinion that, um, you know, day in and day out, just like we said, sometimes the house always wins if you bet it long enough and you're not disciplined. But the thing is those people that give out the morning workout reports, they're going to play when they have a live one. I would think, I mean, that's just going right. to supplement what they do, but day in and day out they're reporting. And so if people are going for a pick four, pick six, or just want to play that day, they're going to get the report and they're going to get paid their X amount of dollars for it. So they're going to have a steady income, but then they're going to have some big hits along the way. Like, Hey, this horse is just working lights out. I don't care if he's three to two, I'm going after it. But if he's five to two or seven to one, even better. So. Right, right, absolutely. And a lot of people uh, that yeah, play no, really those, interesting stuff. Yeah, a lot of people uh, want, they love those first time starters because they know once the cat's out of the bag, he'll never be those odds again. Right, right. Um, yeah, no, for sure. And uh, a, a lot of times, uh, you know, in a, a, at the big meets in, in some of those competitive races, you can get a nice price on some, some of them, even even, even some of the, some of the runners. Uh, and I, I, you know, a lot of people don't like betting maidens and betting those maiden special weight races and first time starters. And I happen to love those races. I, I think having less information to someone who's mm -hmm. truly a student at a game is mm -hmm. an edge is more, yeah. you, you know what I mean? I'd rather go up against you, 
with mm -hmm. less information because I may know something or figure something out that's not glaring everybody in the eye. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. So I, I, I love those races and I love when they put them in a sequence, like <laughs> if there's a pick six and they put the maiden special weight race with eight or 10 first time starters in the middle. I love that. I don't want it the first leg where everybody sees where the money's going. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want it where nobody can see it until they're already, they're already committed, you know, halfway through the bet. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. you, you know, so I love that when, when, when they do that. And a lot, a lot, a lot of players don't, I think it creates an edge. Um, but f fascinating stuff. We've got the big derby preps coming up. Uh, I think workouts will be important. Um, I remember the, I, I always refer to it as, you know, I bet Animal Kingdom when he won the, won, won the Derby on the dirt, um, when everybody thought he might not really be a dirt, but his work before the Derby was what I call the work heard around the world because everybody <laughs> said how great he worked and he did. I mean, it looked, it looked pretty, pretty, pretty. That, that's what I say. When you get those works and they do come along, you know, uh, and you get those kind of works and you're just like, Wow, you know whether it's one of my trainees or another trainer's. If I see him working, I'm like, "Ooh, somebody's got a good one there." You know, don't know what level that horse is going to run at, but that horse looked good. Yeah, no, for sure. So we'll 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 be watching these works, and we'll talk about some more going forward. You know that yeah. that, mm -hmm. that become public. I think uh, I think I'm 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 somewhat feeling vindicated that you felt the same about the life is good work. Um, that, that, that I did that it was a, actually a good work because like I said a lot of a lot of the clockers you know had it as a you know low, I would have thought it, I would have thought it would have been the opposite way around uh, the way he worked he looked like he'd be fine and the way he drifted out in the race you might say he might pull up a little funny but uh, it was kind of reversed so exactly we're maybe exactly. it was brewing and that's why you know we don't know because we're not in the camp at the you know that's their business and right. um and you know we'll we'll find out more as things go along but hey it's always great giving the people what they want to hear and we like to take on the topics so if somebody wants to shoot us an email they they've been coming up with great topics and we're going to give it to them absolutely and this game never ne ne never never fails to provide some uh controversy and interesting stuff to talk about so uh we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll be back with more and we're going into that exciting time of the year with the, the three-year-old so uh always Definitely. a pleasure jeff uh same ciao here now. we'll be back soon and uh stay well ciao